Uh, on behalf of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UCR, I'd like to welcome you to the third presentation in the 2014 Science Lecture Series. I'm Mary Droser. I'm a professor of Earth Sciences. And first thing I want to do is thank our sponsors for this year's Science Lecture. As always, they're supported by the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. But support this year has also come from the Department of Earth Sciences, the Office of Research and Economic Development, and from a new institute, the Institute for Environmental Dynamics and Geoecology, or EDGE Institute. And this is a, a new institute, and it's unique at UCR that it will bring together scientists from biological, chemical, and earth sciences and environmental sciences to examine specific questions about the earth and life in a changing environment, past and present. And the person who will be director of this institute will hold the newly endowed chair, the W.W. W. Mayhew Chair in Geoecology. And this has been made possible by a $1.5 million gift from donors who wish to remain anonymous, but who are passionate about the ecology of the Southwest. And we're deeply indebted to these donors, especially for the commemoration of, of Bill Mayhew. And many of you may know that name because he was a former faculty member at UCR who established the natural reserve system, which is so critical to UCR. So it's very exciting times at geoecology, uh, for geoecology at UCR. And I think Sue Brantley's talk fits in beautifully um, today, as you'll, you'll hear. And like our previous uh, speaker, Kate Freeman, Sue Brantley is in the Department of Geosciences at Penn State. She holds the title of Distinguished uh, Professor and is also the Director of the Earth and Environmental Sciences Institute. And she's been at Penn State since 1991 and is a significant reason why the Department of, Earth si uh, Department of Geosciences there has such a reputation um, as being one of the leaders uh, in the world. And she's known internationally for her research in the chemical, biological, and physical processes associated with the circulation of water below the ground. And she's also been a really important driver in sort of national and international initiatives um, for looking at, at issues in the earth sciences from multiple different disciplines, not just from geology, but from geology and chemistry and physics and so on. And I think that's why she's such an appropriate speaker for this group. Uh, Sue is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of many geological and geochemical associations, both national and international. Um, Dr. Brantley's talk tonight is about fracking. I think that's a topic that's of interest to all of us, and particularly on its impact on water. And tonight you'll get a factual discussion of uh, fracking. So please welcome uh, Dr. Brantley. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction, and uh, thank you for coming out in the sort of hot weather that we're having today. This is a, a welcome change to, to me coming from the East Coast, where it's just been so cold this winter. So I am going to talk about our experience in Pennsylvania with fracking. Uh, what I've been trying to do is uh, pull together as much data as I can, mostly about water quality uh, in Pennsylvania, to try to really look at the facts about this new uh, process that we're that we are uh, uh, you know, really implementing in a big way in this country and especially in, uh, in Pennsylvania. So what is fracking? It's all about uh, getting natural gas, extracting <coughs> natural gas from the subsurface. And natural gas is uh, methane, which is shown here. It's just carbon with four hydrogens. And uh, the best estimate from the US is that we have you know, more than 2,000 trillion cubic feet of recoverable natural gas that before our, the last decade we weren't able to get out of the ground. And so that's what we're now doing is extracting this, this gas and, and using it. Um, about 60% of this is called what we call unconventional gas. So you'll hear about uh, unconventional gas wells. And the reason it's called unconventional is because before we learned how to, to do this hydrofracking, which I'll talk about, we got the gas, natural gas, out of conventional reservoirs. And conventional reservoirs are reservoirs uh, that uh, typically are sandstones that have a lot of porosity. And in the pore spaces, uh, the gas is, is trapped. Well, the gas in sandstone came from somewhere else, and it moved into the sandstone. And we're now going back to where the gas actually formed, the shale. And shale has very low permeability 
We knew that it had natural gas in the subsurface, but before the last decade or so, we didn't know how to get it out. And the hydrofracking is how we break apart the shale to get out the gas. And uh, the numbers are really astounding. Uh, the amount of natural gas that we're now pulling out uh, has really changed the world economy. And we've gone from you know, something like 1% uh, gas from shale to 20% of our natural gas um, is coming from shale. So these just show you in the U.S. some of what are called gas plays. A gas play is just a, a, a shale that can be developed uh, to get natural gas. And one of the biggest, if not the biggest, is the Marcellus. And that's what I'll be talking about. And this is where our data comes from and where I've been thinking about it. So I'll strictly be talking about, about Pennsylvania. So why have you heard about it? Well, one of the reasons is not only because they're talking about fracking out here in Pennsylvania, but because of the speed at which we've started implementing this technique to get the gas out. And this, this animation cycles through. There's 2007, 2008, showing you the gas wells that were drilled in Pennsylvania into the Marcellus. And you can just see how fast these wells have put in across our state. And so part of what's going on here is just the speed of this development. Uh, as we learned how to do this and started implementing, uh, the number of wells, for example, in our state has gone up so fast and it's impacted people. And then there has been some public pushback and that's what you've heard about. So the other part of this is that the wells that have gone in uh, have gone in across an arc uh, of this part of the state, which is controlled by the geology. But uh, many of these wells are going in very rural parts of the state, very beautiful parts of the state where there are exceptional watersheds. And so this new development has impacted the people that live up there, and in some cases it has impacted the water, and so we'll talk about that. So there's been significant pushback. Um, you may have heard or seen the, the movie Gasland, uh, some of which was filmed in Pennsylvania. Uh, the, you may have seen footage of methane coming out of faucets and can be lit on fire, and this, this is something that is true and has happened you know, water in wells that um, have been made turbid, dirty like this. And interestingly enough, this, this speed of development of shale gas, especially in Pennsylvania, and the problems that developed, especially in Pennsylvania, has actually had international impact in that fracking has now been uh, made illegal in France and Bulgaria and some other countries around the world. It's, there's still a moratorium in New York State. So very quick uh, development early, especially early problems, and then public pushback uh, has created an uh, extremely controversial situation. And it's interesting because uh, look at the number of oil and gas wells that have been drilled in Pennsylvania. This is not, this is since 1850. The very first uh, commercial well that was drilled for oil was drilled in uh, northwestern uh, Pennsylvania. And since that time, the Department of Environmental Protection estimates that 350,000 oil and gas wells have been drilled in PA. So my state is not uh, a stranger to oil and gas development at all. Interestingly enough, and this becomes important in terms of the fracking story, maybe 100,000 of them, uh, the location of those 100,000 are unknown. And uh, this is also not uncommon in other, in other areas of the country that oil and gas wells that were drilled early on, sometimes we don't even know where they are. We don't know how they were sealed. Uh, and in, in some cases, they can become conduits to get uh, material from the subsurface to the surface, especially when new um, gas wells are put in. However, the other thing to note is that even though I'm sort of emphasizing that this new form of hydrofracking is very new and has been very um, rapidly developed in the last 10 years, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission estimates that hydrofracking has been used to stimulate something like 90% of the oil and gas wells um, in, in this country. And in fact, the technique of hydrofracking itself, strict hydrofracking, has been used since the 1940s. So the technique itself has been around for a long time. It's the way it's being implemented now. It was used before in sandstones and, and uh, you know, some limestone aquifers or, or reservoirs. Uh, now it's being used on the shale themselves. And so the, the technique has changed in how we're, how we're implementing it. 
I think a piece of why there has been so many, uh, so much public outcry in Pennsylvania is related to this bar graph that I made. And um, this is from a data set that's online in Pennsylvania that's, that's put online by the Department of Envi Environmental Protection that shows all the notices of violations that have been given to the oil and gas wells uh, in Pennsylvania. And if you look, since 2005, um, so the first well that's, that was hydrofracked in the way that I'm talking about was in 2004, but there was eight wells, um, six out of eight had notices of violations in 05, and you can see that kind of on average about 20% of the wells are getting notices of violations. Most of these are small problems, small violations. I took out all the paperwork violations, um, but you can see the kinds of uh, violations that they're getting cited for. I think this relatively high rate of problems, citations, is a part of the public outcry. I think that the, the speed of development in Pennsylvania has made it so it hasn't been done very carefully. When it's not done carefully and it's almost in your backyard, uh, public uh, pushes back. Uh, you can also see here, these are a map of all the wells in Pennsylvania that have at least one violation. And again, you can see it's all over the state. There's two hot spots for the drilling up here in the northeast and then down here in the, in the southwest. So what I'm going to be doing through this talk is looking at the data that I can pull out of the online database from the Department of Environmental Protection and then look at other kinds of data that I've been pulling together and that is from the USGS, US Geological Survey and from the Environmental Protection Agency and try to sh give you a sense of what the kind of problems are and the, and the scale of it. So I thought I should start with showing you a picture of an unconventional gas shale. This is the Marcellus. In some places it, it outcrops. Uh, in the parts of the state where it outcrops, where you can actually see it, um, that's not where it's being produced. It's always being produced where it's um, thousands of feet um, in depth. This is a scanning electron micrograph image of a section of, a, of uh, the shale. This is 100 nanometers, so it's a very high magnification. It's got a little bit of pyrite. Here's the organic matter. This is biota. This is living material that was uh, sedimented a long time ago, along with clay and mud and became compacted into uh, just organic matter. And the little pores in here, the little black spots are little holes in the organic matter. This is largely where the gas is. This is where the natural gas is. And somehow it has to get out. It's trapped in here. This rock, um, fluid does not move through this rock. And so the whole game is fracturing this to get it out. So an unconventional gas shale is a shale with low permeability, very little conductivity. You can't get fluid through it and you have to frack it, fracture it to, to open it up. This is a map, again, here is Pennsylvania. This is the depth to the Marcellus. It's important to note that where the natural gas is being recovered, the gas is between 2,000 and uh, 9,000 feet depth. We drink water from about 100 feet, so the gas is coming from much, much deeper depths, um, shallower up here and get, getting deeper uh, uh, to Towards, uh, towards the center of the state. This just shows that same thing in cross-section. Here is over here in Youngstown, Ohio, and uh, Lake Erie. And you can see that uh, the Marcellus Shale, this is what we're drilling into, sometimes as deep as uh, 9,000 feet in Pennsylvania. It's important to note that uh, even deeper than the Marcellus, so down here below the Marcellus Shale, is uh, salt deposits. And this is, again, a, a map of Pennsylvania showing a, a contour of thickness of this, of this salt deposit, uh, the Salina salt. This is only important because the water that is, is in this formation and has risen above this formation and has gotten up into the shale is extremely salty. So this uh, salt deposit uh, is in contact with water that's seven times the saltiness of, of seawater. And that water, when the gas comes up, that water comes up with the, with the gas, and that's part of uh, the environmental issues. Okay, so what is this hydrofracking? This is uh, a pictorial image of what the hydrofracking looks like. In Pennsylvania, the shales that we're drilling into are basically more or less horizontal. And as I said, there are thousands of feet in the subsurface. And so what, what's done is uh, a vertical well is drilled down through the overlying rock 
And then when we get to the shale layer, they, they actually bend uh, the borehole and, and turn a bend, it's called uh, the kickoff, and then they can, dr they can drill right through the shale. And uh, this horizontal drilling, the ability to horizontally drill, is, is a piece of what makes the process different now. This is something that we couldn't do um, you know, as well as we can do it today up until fairly recently. And I've even heard drillers talk about being able to hit a watermelon, you know, thousands of feet in the subsurface. That's how precise they can, they can uh, do this drilling. Uh, the, the drilling then is then used to get huge volumes of water down here into this rock and at very high pressure that fractures the rock. And on average in PA, they're, they're using something like 4 million gallons per frac job. And of that 4 million gallons, only about 10 or 20 percent of it comes back up. And the amount that they use varies for sh per, per shale. So in different uh, shale plays, they use different amounts of, of water, but they always use very large volumes. And in different shale plays, the amount that comes back also varies. So this is another pictorial image. Here's that horizontal uh, well bore. And they go in there and uh, they, they put little, they have casing along the well bore. They drill little holes along it. And then they, uh, in sections of that horizontal bore, they pump down this high pressure, uh, high volume of water. And they do it at such a high pressure that it causes fracturing of the, of the shale. And this fracturing then is what allows the natural gas that's in those tiny little pores to get out come into the bore, and then once they open up the valve at the top, it comes back up to the surface. So this is the whole trick. And being able to do this fracking is the trick that they try to uh, make it as good as they can. And what they have discovered is if they put chemicals in the water, they can make the frack job work better. And if they put sand in the water, the sand, which is shown here in these little yellow uh, circles or symbols, the sand gets flushed out into the fracture and then when the fracture tries to close back up, as the gas comes out and the pressure drops, the sand props it open. So it's called a propant. And so really the, the, the trick is to get a recipe with chemicals that help you make the fracture and with sand to keep open those fractures. And this is what they, what they do. Uh, you can read a little bit about this. Uh, talks about how big some of these fractures are. Um, and again, this you know, shows you for each stage, they only use 300,000 to 500,000 gallons, but the 4 million was for the whole uh, borehole. So when they're drilling, this is what it looks like. This is a, a drilling site in Pennsylvania. Most of the sites that they drill in Pennsylvania are at the ridge tops. And uh, this drill rig is only there for you know, a couple weeks, however long it takes them to do the drilling. And then all, a lot of this, all of this really is, is removed. So this now is kind of what they're doing in the subsurface. Here's where that drill rig is, drilling vertically and then bending. And one of the reasons these wells are so successful is they can put multiple laterals out from, from one well. And if you think about it, that's a huge volume that they're actually accessing of that shale. And that's, again, why these things are so, so efficient. And I've been up to one of the most beautiful parts of Pennsylvania, in, you know, down at a riverbed you know, near a, a little town, looking up at the ridge, and a lot of times you can't even see the, the gas wells up there, and it's just astounding to think that the, you know, the well bore comes down and is, you know, can often go like a mile uh, in the, horizontally underneath you. This is what it looks like when it's in production, and uh, what you see is the separator, so the gas comes up with water and it has to be separated, heaters to help that separation. And then the gas is collected, and uh, there are pipelines that take the gas uh, and, and you know, take, take that away, because that's what's being sold. And then the brine, the very, very salty water, is stored. And the first water that comes back is called flowback, and then when they're producing the gas, they call it production water. But it doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing, flowback, production water. It's the brine, brine's just a word for salty water, that's collected and then has to be disposed of. So the part of this that many people are worried about, uh, people in the public, in the public uh, worried about, is the chemicals that are being used to do the hydrofracking. And this just is a table that tells you the different kinds of chemicals that are added 
and a little bit of some of the different compounds that are used and why they're put in. And really, you know, it's an art. Um, and different companies use different uh, chemicals. Um, I'm told that they're changing their chemicals they're using all the time. They're always trying to get the best chemical to give them the best advantage. And there's actually a huge uh, list of chemicals that are used. Uh, and really, before 2011 in Pennsylvania, the companies didn't have to tell um, anyone what they were using. In 2011, Pennsylvania required disclosure of chemicals and fluids. There's still no federal law requiring disclosure. However, some different states do, do require uh, disclosure. And now you can go online to frack focus, and many of the states you can look up on a well-by-well -well basis and see what they're using. With one, with one exception, if they're using a compound that is um, you know, proprietary, they've come up with it's something special they've developed, they don't have to put that um, on frack focus. So this is from a report by the House of Representatives. Uh, this is back in, uh, I think this was in 2010, if I remember correctly. They, they uh, concluded that about 750 chemicals had been used in hydraulic fracturing. Some crazy things like walnut hulls, you know, all sorts of things have been used. And of these, uh, 29 chemicals were components uh, that uh, could be considered carcinogenic uh, or uh, some kind of risk for uh, human health. And here's the 29. The EPA now has made another list like this, but here's the 29. You can see some of the, some of the different compounds. And this really has been what uh, most people have, have been worried about. Now, one of the worries that people have is that it'll be pumped down, fractured, and somehow get into drinking water. But I wanted to point out that some of these compounds actually come back up with the brine. So one worry you might have is this fracturing in the subsurface. Maybe the chemicals could somehow get into drinking water. But you also have to realize that the compounds come back up in the water. And this just so shows an example. Here's the concentration of benzene versus time days after hydrofracking. And you can see in the, the return that some of the benzene came back up. And then it, it decreases uh, uh, to sort of concentrations that uh, are, are quite a bit lower than in, in, the, in the beginning. But there's no known cases of hydrofrac fluids contaminating drinking water from movement at depth in Pennsylvania. So the, the thing that most people are worried about, namely, we're pumping down toxins into the subsurface. Are those toxins going to move in the subsurface into my drinking water? That's the thing that most people talk about as being worried about. There's no known case of that having happened in Pennsylvania. In fact, there's only two alleged cases na nationwide, um, and they're both really controversial. Uh, one was in 1987 in West Virginia. Very little data about that. Uh, the other is in Pavilion in Wyoming, and there's a lot of uh, controversy. Very little data has been presented about that also. The hydrofracking in Pavilion, Wyoming, was also extremely shallow. They were drinking water in the upper 100, 100 feet or meters, and they were just fracking you know, uh, 100 feet or meters below that. So it was not the best case scenario. Um, you know, the fracking that we're doing in Pennsylvania is at thousands of feet, of feet depth. But to my mind, this is probably not what we have to worry about, that the fracking in the subsurface is going to somehow connect up into our aquifers. The fracking in most places is at, you know, thousands of feet depth. We're drinking drinking water up at 100 feet depth. So in terms of what I worry about, this is not what I think of as, as, as what is worrisome. So a lot of these plots I'm showing you are from a database that we've put together, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But here is uh, an example of what the flowback chemistry looks like. I told you it was very salty. So this is concentration versus time, and you can pull this out of our database and make these plots. This is chloride concentration milligrams per liter doesn't really matter. This is up to 200,000 parts per million, so much, much, much higher concentration than seawater. And this is what characteristically happens with these waters as they come back. They're kind of dilute in the beginning, and that's because whatever water was pumped down tends to be more dilute than the brine in the subsurface. And that, some of that water comes back, but then slowly it turns into the brine which is down there in the subsurface. So it's, both, it's mostly a sodium-calcium chloride brine. 
relatively low in magnesium and sulfate. All of these elements increase with time. Sometimes pH, alkalinity, and sulfate actually decrease with time, and you know we could talk about that if, if you wanted to. But there's a stew of different elements in here at very, very high concentrations. It's also important to note that there, are, there is some natural radium in these waters, and this is just a plot showing two different isotopes of radium, sort of two different types of radium. They're both, they're both uh, uh, they're radioactive. And so the radium increases with time as well. And these are referred to as naturally occurring radioactive materials. Turns out every shale play has a different amount of radioactive uh, material, and the Appalachian Basin, the basin that I'm talking about here, <coughs> has the highest concentration of radioactive material. Now, these concentrations are extremely low, very, very low. And uh, there, there aren't necessarily problems about this, except that we're bringing all this brine up and we're, we're storing a lot of it, sometimes precipitating sludge from it and then taking that sludge to landfills. So there, there could be problems with the fact that there's radioactivity in here, but um, it's, it's at extremely low concentrations. So this is what the EPA is thinking about, and I'll kind of walk my way through examples of these. Talk about water volume, you know, what about these large withdrawals, hydrofracking itself, I already talked a little bit about this, fracking fluids, um, could they be spilled? You know, maybe they're not going to get into drinking water this way, but could the hydrofrack fluids themselves be spilled? And then what do we do with the flow back and produce waters, and how do we treat that? So the first, uh, the first of those, the volume of water, I have to say, we don't worry about this too much in Pennsylvania. It rains all the time in Pennsylvania. The volume usage of water is a much more important uh, problem in, in the Southwest, out here. It's something that you should be thinking about, um, but I haven't thought too much about. This is actually a map, again, of Pennsylvania, and here's the Susquehanna River Basin, the watershed, and all these uh, pink dots here are where um, oil and gas companies are permitted to take water and use it. So uh, there's a huge amount of water being used, but if you look at how many uh, billion gallons of water per day are, are withdrawn for use in Pennsylvania, it still dwarfs what is being used in the Marcellus. So this is billions of gallons per day, and this is millions of gallons per day. So there's a lot of water in Pennsylvania and I don't really think the sort of volume of the water is, is a particular problem. But again, it's, it's different out here in, in the drier part of the state. Here's some of the different kinds of contaminants that, that we have to worry about, that, some of which I haven't mentioned yet, and I'll kind of, kind of talk my way through these. There's also drilling muds and cuttings. I haven't mentioned that. Uh, the drilling and hydrofracking only lasts um, up to two months. Then the equipment and activity is gone, but nonetheless, when, when it's happening, these can get it can, can, then, can be spilled. Frac fluids can be spilled. There's also a lot of air emissions, and I don't talk about this very much, but this is um, also of interest, and, and people are thinking about this. Natural sediments, I mean, the truck traffic and the moving of, of heavy equipment around causes there to be all sorts of erosion. That's sort of, sort of natural sediment, but still it's important. Uh, methane, we'll talk about methane getting into drinking water. And then these natural contaminants that are in the flow back in the production fluids. So these are all the different kinds of ways that these uh, contaminants can get into the waterways, direct spills, we'll talk a little bit about that. Trucking spills, these compounds and uh, fluids are being moved all around, so all, any kind of accidents. Methane migration, the methane can come back up in the well bore, it can get out of the well bore and can move into groundwater. Uh, effluent from tre treatment facilities, um, this is largely not a problem in Pennsylvania, so I won't really talk about this very much, a little bit I'll talk about and then erosion and sediment I've already mentioned. Okay, so this is the project that I've been working on. It's called the Shale Network. National Science Foundation gave us money to pull all kinds of data together and to publish it online. I find it, I think it's a travesty how difficult it is to find water quality data. And so what we've been doing is trying to get data from universities, industry, from government agencies, and then from watershed groups, citizen scientists that have been trained to take um, and collect good data and publish it online to, be, to make it so that uh, anyone can look, can look at the kind of data. You can go to our website and look at what we're doing. Uh, uh, we're really focused quite a bit on Pennsylvania, but also um, West Virginia, Ohio, New York a little bit. And uh, we do this all with National Science Foundation money. 
and they have a big project to put water data online uh, to make it very accessible. And the way we do this, the online database, allows um, you also to find data from the U.S. Geological Survey and the EPA. And so, uh, arguably, that's kind of the biggest data set you can get for these kinds of groundwater and surface water. So I'm just going to kind of talk my way through some examples now, different uh, incident examples. We'll talk about drilling, injection, and hydrofracking. This is an example of, uh, of uh, drilling muds that uh, there was, they were drilling underneath um, what's called Larry's Creek in northern Pennsylvania. This was a beautiful stream, uh, and uh, they, they say they fracked out. There was a um, fracturing that occurred, and, and the, uh, some of the uh, drilling muds got up into the, into the stream. And the, re the release occurred in 1019, 2011. And as I go through the rest of this talk, I'm really going to be talking about different incidents, and then I'm going to be talking about statistics from the Department of Environmental Protection. The incidents are from our database, and then the sort of rate of incidents is from the Department of Environmental Protection. And what I would like to be able to do is have enough data that I can find all these things in my database that they're reporting on their online database, but you can't do that. And the reason is, and this is one of the main findings that I want you to go home with, is that it's still, even despite you know, our efforts and other people's efforts to find data, it's hard to find data. It's hard to find the water quality data you need to be able to evaluate yourself. So from our database, I'll show you, you know, isolated incidents. From the DEP database, which is online, which is just a summary, I'll try to show you some frequency of problems, frequency of incidents. And we've published a paper where we've done this compared to sort of these incidents and then the frequency of incidents. And we were criticized because we were relying on the DEP database, and there are people that don't believe the DEP database. They think that the Environmental Protection, the Department of Environmental Protection, is not, is not uh, looking hard enough and carefully enough. But that's the only way to get the data. That's the only thing that we can get. And so I, I wanted to look at what was available. So this Larry's Creek spill, uh, you can see it in our database. This is data from the Susquehanna River Basin Commission uh, sensors. This is turbidity, which is just uh, sort of muddiness of the water, versus time. And uh, you can see the turbidity of any river changes by uh, how much rainfall there is. Here's the day of the spill, and the sensor was downstream. So, you know, the inference is, you know, some of the spill could be sort of in this little part of the data, or more likely, this could be uh, the spill itself. But for this particular spill, which you can find on the DEP database, this is the, the sum extent of the data uh, that we have accessible. And here we plotted it, here again is the turbidity, turbidity, turbidity data, the, the red, uh, and then precipitation. And you can see that most of these spikes in turbidity prior to the spill can be correlated with the precipitation. And so big rainfall event, lots of mud goes into the stream, but here, you don't see any precipitation, and here's that big uh, turbidity event. So here's an example. We can see it in our database. You can see it on the DEP um, online. Now, how did we find it in our database? We found it because we knew it had happened because it was reported in the newspaper. Um, typically, uh, it, it's, it's difficult often to find out when these events exactly occurred, where they occurred, and that's a piece of the problem also. It's just hard to get that kind of information. Eventually, they go up on the DEP database. Um, so I already talked about this a little bit. Does transport of contaminants through porous rock or fractures bring fracking constituents or subsurface brine into the water? The answer is we have no examples of that. I've already said this to you, but I like to repeat it because this is something that people are, are uh, very worried about. This is a plot from uh, the oil and gas industry. And here, from this land surface down 9,000 feet, this is sort of uh, a picture of where we get our water resources up here in the shallow part. And then this is where, this is a, you know, a borehole that's been drilled, and these are the hydrofracks, just emphasizing the distance between uh, you know, the hydrofracking and, and the water. And uh, this is just a quote from the CEO of Exxon. To our knowledge, there have been a million wells fracked and no documented cases of a contamination of groundwater from hydraulic fracturing. And as I've said multiple times, I have no data uh, to show any case like this also, but again, it's hard to get your hands on data. 
There have been models. Uh, this is a paper in Groundwater that was published by a hydrogeologist uh, where he tried to make a model of how it might be possible for contaminants down here to get up here. And the problem, of course, is what is the rock structure here and the permeability in between? And we don't typically know that. And so with a model, you can put any kind of permeability and rock structure in that you wanted. And he showed that the model um, suggested that transport to the surface would require anywhere from 10 to tens of thousands of years. And I, I think that, you know, we don't have any data to constrain that at all. Um, it, but this is the kind of model and the kind of thinking that has created a lot of uh, nervousness and anxiety. Now, frac fluids have not moved from depth to aquifers, to my knowledge. Brines have not moved from, from depth to aquifers, to my knowledge. But methane has. So methane migration is something that has occurred uh, and actually has occurred at a fairly high frequency. Um, not, I mean, I should say there are many incidents of it. It's, it's not a hugely high frequency. But it's something that we know happens. Um, 44 million people drink water from water supplies, from wells, and uh, there are many ways that methane can get into those wells. So there can be biogenic methane, methane like swamp gas that's natural, that can move into water wells. And then uh, there can also be uh, what's called thermogenic methane, methane that comes out of some of these uh, deeper shales that can actually move up into water wells, and that can be a natural process also. And then you can, you can have drilling, and if this drilling, uh, if the borehole actually leaks, then methane can actually get into water wells. And all of these um, are known to happen. So uh, there are a few studies uh, in Pennsylvania up around Dimmick, which is a famous place uh, in terms of problems in Pennsylvania, in terms of this methane migration. This is one from Osborne et al., a group out of Duke University. <coughs> where they went up to uh, northeastern Pennsylvania uh, and they did some sampling up into New York State as well. And what they, what they saw, this is a, one of the sweet spots where there's a lot of drilling. What they saw is the methane concentration in water wells that they sampled were higher uh, the closer they were to the nearest drilled gas well. And the further away they went, the lower the concentrations were. And this is the action level. These, are, these concentrations go from 0 to 70 milligrams per, per liter methane. This is the action level for hazard mitigation. Uh, and they argued that this was very good evidence that, uh, that this drilling was causing uh, migration uh, into the methane, or into the, some of these water wells. And indeed, the DEP has studied some of this. And this is uh, largely some of the drilling early on it was one particular company that was not casing and finishing their wells correctly, and the DEP um, did agree that some of this was uh, due to uh, the drilling. They, they, worked, they looked also by looking at the isotopes of the methane, and uh, you can look at uh, what kind of carbon is in the, in the methane, the isotopes, and tell whether it, the methane came from shale or if it came from uh, biogenic microbial processes, and indeed, uh, the, the houses that they thought were the closest to the gas wells and they thought were, was getting shale gas um, isotopically looks like that was um, indeed true. However, they had no pre-drill data to compare to and it turns out that all uh, in much of Pennsylvania, especially the northern part, many people's water wells have methane. And so I believe in that area that I've just showed you the DEP has also agreed that some of, those, some of that methane was due to shale gas. But in many parts of Pennsylvania, it's very difficult to definitively show this because the water wells often have methane even before any drilling happens. And one very nice study that, that uh, compared pre-drill to post-drill is a study by Beth Boyer and Brian Swistock. They analyzed uh, 230 samples within 1,000 feet and within a mile of Marcellus Wells and they saw no significant difference before or after changes in water quality. But they did conclude that 40% of the wells failed at least one drinking water standard. Turns out in Pennsylvania, there really are no standards for drinking water wells, and many of the people were drinking water that really didn't live up to standards that had been imposed in other states. 
25% of the wells had measurable methane. And they had it sometimes before and after the drilling. And so uh, this is part of the problem. The oil and gas companies now argue that a lot of the methane that people are blaming on drilling was actually there prior. And uh, the only way you can prove it is to have pre-drill and post-drill, which is what uh, the companies are doing, is taking samples pre-drill now in order to be able to, to, to really ascertain if there is a problem. This is just a histogram, number of measurements. This is across uh, sort of the tri-state area. You can see that uh, many samples, uh, all these samples here in the, in the red, these are all pre-drilling or they're from New York State where there is no drilling, or from West Virginia uh, before the hydrofracking, you can see that there's a very big range in concentration of methane in wells that have nothing to do with the hydrofracking. And then that study that I showed you where they were seeing methane in, water, in some water wells in Dimmick uh, that have been attributed to the, to, the, um, to the drilling, the average for those wells is right about in here. It's sort of right in the middle, if you will, of this whole range of the natural occurring methane. So this makes for controversy, right? Because there's often methane there to start with, and then if there's methane after the drilling, you have to prove where it came from. Uh, because of some of these problems with the methane, the Pennsylvania regulations have now been tightened up. It used to be that uh, a, a, a gas company was only uh, liable for uh, problems with water within a thousand feet, it's been increased to 2,500 feet. It used to be they were only liable for the first six months and now they're liable for, the, for, for 12 months. And so one of the things that's been happening in Pennsylvania is they've been tightening the regulations and I think appropriately so. This shows you all the data that we can find for methane concentrations in this area and uh, the size of the symbol here tells you how much, how much methane up to that 71 milligrams per liter is the biggest. Is the biggest. The red dots are the ones where measurements by the Department of Environmental Protection have been attributed to oil or gas activity. And uh, the two things you can see here, first of all, there sure is a dearth of data in Pennsylvania. There's very little data. And this is part of what I keep saying. A lot of times there are measurements, but they're not being released. The data isn't released. You can't get your hands on it. The other thing, uh, obviously, some very high methane concentrations that have nothing to do with uh, oil and gas activity. And then finally, where there are methane problems in Pennsylvania, look, it's, it seems to be all in the northern part of the state. And I think this is the glaciated part of the state, and I think the, the glaciation actually makes it so the geology up here makes it more prone to some of these problems. This shows the percent of sputted wells, that means drilled wells, in each county that have received a, a notice of violation that they didn't cement or case their well correctly. So the way the methane gets out is, you know, the drilling, they put in casing, they put in steel tubes, and then they pump in cement that, that, that seals up the annular spaces. And if that cement doesn't work right, then the methane can get out and can get into the, into the rocks. And so uh, you can sort of see that Again, a lot of the problems with sealing these, these wells are, are, are worse in the northern part of the state. Turns out in the northern part of the state, there's often methane at sort of medium depths, and when there's methane getting into your borehole, uh, it can actually make the cementing more difficult. And so I think that the, the cementing and learning how to do it in Pennsylvania um, has taken a little bit of a learning curve. So flowback and production waters, um, the, the, uh, this just shows the volume. Use this, use this one because it's going on and off. Is this on now? Um, okay, so I don't, is that on? Is it? Okay. So this just shows volume of produced water uh, versus time in Pennsylvania. And it was going up very, very fast. This is how much brine is coming up to the surface. And then it went back down and has gone down very to quite small amounts. And that's because what we started doing in Pennsylvania, this was an innovation, instead of pumping down clean water, we started pumping down the dirty water to do the fracking with the dirty water, which makes a whole lot of sense. Now, it's a little bit harder to do, and so the, the companies had to figure out how to do it. But I think about 90% of the brine now is pumped back down. The problem, of course, is we're still hydrofracking wells, 
Eventually, we're going to stop hydrofracking, and the brine will keep coming up, and then it has to be disposed. Uh, in fact, uh, before 2011 in Pennsylvania, it was actually permitted to send some of the water to municipal water treatment plants, and then it was discharged into the rivers. And municipal water treatment plants don't do anything to take the salt out of the water. So this was one of the really bad things that happened early on in Pennsylvania. And uh, you may have heard about this because before 2011, people started noticing that there was bromide in the river water that was then being taken up for the Pitts Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority. And you can see that again, this is in our database. This is bromide concentration versus time. You can see how the bromide's going up and down. It's varying basically because of um, uh, just the, it gets diluted whenever there's big rainstorms. So this is, you know, this is bromide and then this is the discharge, the volume of the river itself. So the bromide's going up and down because it's getting diluted by, by water. The problem with the bromide was it, it would combine with natural organic matter and make compounds that are known to be hazardous for human health. And so after 2011, it became uh, advised not to be dumping this uh, brine uh, through municipal water treatment plants uh, into rivers. So that, that has stopped. But again, early on, there were mistakes made that uh, you know, created public outcry. Uh, I think I'll skip this because I'm going a little bit long. Uh, there have been cases uh, in Pennsylvania where the Department of Environmental Protection has uh, attributed salt in drinking water to oil and gas activity. There's 22 cases that we've seen in their, in their uh, database. They're mostly up here again in the northern part of the state. And very little data is available once again for this. We, we've got a memorandum of understanding with the state for them to give us some of this data and we're trying to get that to, be, to put it online. But there are a few cases of salt getting into drinking water. Now where did the salt come from? The salt could come, could be that brine coming up, getting into drinking water. But uh, it could also be from spills of the brine. It could be from, they move the brine around in trucks. It could be uh, trucking accidents. And then there is brine in the subsurface of Pennsylvania at fairly shallow depths. And so the drilling could have just moved shallow brine around as well. So again, this is the kind of thing we need data to be able to figure out what happened in these small number of cases. Okay, um, I think uh, this is like a small study that it wasn't done for hydrofracking, but it kind of gives you an idea for the complexity of the geology in our, in our state. This particular case, there was a quarry on this ridge top. This is a, um, what's called a LIDAR image. These are ridges and here's our, here are our valleys in, in uh, sort of north central Pennsylvania. It was alleged that some chemicals uh, being used in this quarry were actually coming out over here, so they did a tracer test. They dumped some bromide into the bottom of this quarry here, and then they measured bromide as a function of time over here in this seep. And most hydrogeologists would say if you dump water here, it's going to go into the subsurface, it's going to come out into this river valley here. Well, they saw nothing here, and they saw nothing over here, but they did see bromide coming out over here. And this is the data, this shows bromide. Here was the tracer injection, and then you know, measured over here in this seep, uh, the bromide slowly went up, and here's that bromide coming out. They did a second injection, and here's a second little peak. And so part of the problem with being able to figure out what's going on with some of the incidents in Pennsylvania are that the rocks are, are, are fractured even at the surface, and in this particular case, these are the directions of the fractures. And so there are fractured uh, directions in the subsurface such that water that went in here traveled in the subsurface in this direction and came out over here. And so when there are incidents, when there are problems, figuring out you know, if a drill rig drilling here could have affected something over here, you need to get all the data to be able to figure it out. Now this is not a hydrofracking case, this is just a sort of a hydrogeologic case to kind of give you an idea about the, the complexity. So this is a compendium of the, of the incidents versus time. Just to give you an idea, um, here's the number of wells drilled. Uh, I, I divided it by 100 just to get it on the plot. Um, so this is the number of wells drilled, kind of peaked, 
in uh, 2011. And then this is the number of wells uh, hydrofracked. So this is new producing wells. That's just fancy phrasing for the wells that were actually hydrofracked. So not all wells have been hydrofracked. We're still hydrofracking the numbers of those that are going up. The large spills, these are the sort of significant spills that we can find in the, in the DEP data set and, and um, from media reports, really are very, very small in number. There's 31 large spills. So that's a very small number when you consider that there are now um, 7,000 wells that have been drilled and 4,000 have been hydrofracked. You can see what the spills were. There was diesel spill, um, a unknown discharge, air foam, this is something they used to drill, uh, hydrostatic testing water, sediment, frac fluid spills, there were six frac fluid spills, drilling muds, and then flowback produced water brine, um, nine of those spills. Now it is slightly disturbing that the number of spills is going up, um, even though the number of drilling, uh, number of drills, uh, drill sites has been going down. And it may be paralleling uh, the number that have been hydrofracked. You can, we put as much information as we could about all the different spill sites. Often we have a hard time figuring out exactly when they've happened, um, but we sort of put it out there. It's very hard for us to find example of these in our, in our, in our data sets though, and I'll show you one example um, at the end. The final thing is cases of groundwater contamination. And this is the plot of the number of cases of groundwater contamination from um, about 2008 to 2012. And we had to work really hard to try to understand this data, and I explained it here. From 2008 to 2012, the DEP received about 1,000 complaints about contamination of drinking water wells. 17% of those were deemed by the DEP to be caused by oil and gas. Half of those were conventional gas wells. Okay, we have some normal conventional gas wells. And the rest of them, so about 80 of them, were due to unconventional oil and gas. So really, over this time frame from 08 to 2012, if you believe the DEP, ta DEP data, which you know, I think it's, it's pretty good, there was only about 80 cases. Now the problem is that each case can implicate, implicate more than one gas well or more than one drinking well. So it's really difficult to figure out exactly how many of the gas wells were bad wells. And to the best of our ability, we went through some arguments and discussions with the DEP, not arguments with the DEP, but arguments uh, to convince ourselves, logical arguments. If you figure that um, the conventional oil and gas wells typically only impact a few water wells, that's what the DEP tells you. Whereas the unconventional oil and gas wells, at least in one case, contaminated 18 water wells. This is endemic early on when uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't cementing the wells correctly. From those kind of data, we estimate that between 7 and 64 unconventional gas wells contaminated 85 drinking water well sites. And that amounts to 0.1, between 0.1 and 1% of the 6,000 wells. So it's a very, very low frequency of problems uh, to the best of our ability to glean from this uh, data. And it really is consistent with the notices of the violations. The DEP says that only 0.2% of the gas wells have, been, have, have violated the law in terms of my, methane migration into, into groundwater. So I'm trying to give you a picture that, yes, there were problems. Yes, the problems were particularly problematic early on, but the actual numbers of problems when you look at it in terms of the number of gas wells that have been drilled, is actually pretty small. And if, if we could get our hands on all the data, we could, could, we could conclude that with great confidence. We can only find a very small number of incidents in our publicly available database. Here's one. This is up in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, this is uh, Bob's Creek. And, um, it just shows a really tiny little spill. This is um, strontium versus time, and the date of the spill was right here. Uh, this is the data that we can get before the spill, and then you can see this one data point that shows you, shows you the high strontium. Strontium happens to be an element that's very diagnostic of the Marcellus brines, and then it quickly went back down to background concentrations. 
Uh, we looked at barium, another diagnostic element. One, you know, possibly you could convince yourself that there was uh, an increase in barium, but it didn't go back down, so, you know, I'm not so sure. It's a very small data set. Uh, chloride, again, you can see here's the chloride back before the spill. I think there's one data point here that shows the high chloride. All these high chloride events prior, these are road salt events. So, you know, if you look at them, at least I'm inferring they're road salt. They're, they usually are in February, huge freezing rainstorms that we have, and lots of salt going out there. So, you know, this is not a very big spill, but this is one of the only ones that I can get that I have good data for this particular stream. And this is conductivity versus time, and the problem here is we don't have data from, from before, the, um, before the spill. So anyway, just to kind of wrap up, the incidence of significant water quality impacts in Pennsylvania due to shale gas activities, according to the DEP data, have occurred at relatively low frequency. There aren't a lot of problems when you look at it in the context of how many wells. And then the contaminates have been, complete, com have been quickly diluted. But firm conclusions are really impossible, they're very difficult, because we often lack specific information about location and timing of incidents. A lot of water quality data are not released because of liability and confidentiality issues. Sample, sample and sensor data for analytes of interest are sparse, both in terms of space and time. Pre-existing water quality impairments make it difficult to figure out the impact from the, from the shale gas, so things like acid mine drainage in our state or road salt. And then a lot of sensors have been put out there, but, but it can be very difficult to interpret the sensor data. I showed you sensor data for that one uh, mud spill uh, it's not clear whether that sensor was even working correctly um, when the spill was, was detected. So I think that the incidence of problems is actually relatively small, but I'd feel a lot more confident saying that if I could get my hands on, on more data. So this is the sort of take home. First of all, I want to reiterate again, we don't see any incidents where frac fluids in the subsurface have moved into drinking water. Second, geology really matters. You know, when the gas companies came up and their experience had been in Texas and in Oklahoma, they, they thought they knew how to do it in Pennsylvania. Well, it turns out Pennsylvania operated a little differently. Geology is different in different places. I think the glaciated part of the state, there's more problems up there, and I think there has to be more care with the cementing, and they've learned how to do it. Perhaps we should have started slow and learned instead of starting fast. Um, I think the frequency of significant problems appears to be small, but again, uh, we need data. I think everyone should demand sharing of data. Um, almost every kind of data gatherer doesn't like to share their data. University people don't like to share it because we like to publish and get famous with our data. You know, government doesn't want to share their data because of liability issues. Industry doesn't want to share because of liability. Homeowners don't want to share because they're worried that they won't be able to sell their house if there's a problem. We really need to, to demand uh, this data uh, be shared. And the things that I think we need to think about and worry about and really be cognizant of are methane migration that definitely happens, brine disposal issues. We're going to, as we do this, we're going to end up with a lot of brine and we need to know what we're going to do with it and how we're going to dispose of it. We have to think about spills. It worries me a little bit that the number of spills was, was going up in my state, but there was a very small number of significant spills. Uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials, uh, I think it's something to be thinking about. Uh, you know, I, not too many people have thought too hard about that yet. It, you know, it hasn't posed any big problems or anything, but I think we have to think it through. And then I didn't really show you any examples, but the old wells that are already there, those are short circuits. You know, those are pathways to the surface. And uh, the West Virginia case that's very controversial that may have shown hydrofrac fluids in the subsurface coming back to a drinking water well, the people that think that happened, they implicate an old oil or gas well that was there and that short-circuited it. And so the fact that we don't even know where some of these old wells are is, is worrisome. And there have been problems in our state. There was one place where methane came back up and actually came back at such a high pressure because it came back through this old well that it formed what, what the media called a methane geyser. So water and methane was shooting into the air by the side of a road and it was, a, um, it was quickly fixed. You know, they plugged the old well and they plugged it up so they stopped it. But um, 
these old wells are, are worrisome as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Great. We'll take some questions now. We have uh, two people who are walking along with mics. And uh, so raise your hand and we'll send somebody to a mic there. And before I do that, uh, there's a blue Ford uh, 7AGX723 parking lights are left on. So if that's you, you're here to stay. No, if that's <laughs> So anyway, uh, the students with the blue shirts can find, we'll start with, with somebody over here. And please stand. Um, is this on? Yes. yes. So, is it possible that these um, oil, uh, these, these wells that are being oil oil and natural gas wells are being created, um, can possibly be creating sort of faults down, you know, far below the surface, sort of like invisible faults that you can't really tell, you know, an earthquake might just. Um, you know, screw us up. <laughs> um, that is what people think about and worry about. Um, that's why I reiterated that it, it's never been documented to have happened. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency is doing a study of hydrofracking, and they are trying to uh, make models to see if that kind of thing could happen and how likely it could be to happen. Um, it's, you know, thousands of feet down. And to somehow think that a fracture is going to be able to bring it all the way back up, I mean, it seems very unlikely uh, to, to most people. I, and, you know, on this slide, I'm trying to sort of point out what, what is more likely to happen. And all these old oil and gas wells, some of which we don't even know they're there, are more likely to bring the stuff back up than, you know, some kind of fracture that you know has never we've never seen happen before, um, but you could never say never, of course. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. I uh, work for the uh, State Water Resources Control Board, and we are one of two agencies in the state that are keenly interested in fracking in the future of California. The other one is the Department of Oil and Gas and Geothermal. Resources. Is anybody here? Dogger? Is the acronym? <laughs> anyway, um, as a regulator, what recommendations can you make to the regulatory community about what to measure in an area before they begin fracking? What constituents would be the most telltale, if you will, um, if fracking is making it to the surface? Well, definitely methane. Uh, you'd want to measure methane before. Um, and you know, I went through that many times. Um, I also think that the compounds that they use for fracking uh, are used in very low concentration. And if they were to come back up, and if they were to get into drinking water well, they would be in extremely low concentrations. They would be extremely hard to detect. There also tend to be organic compounds, which can be very complex to detect, although you have some chemists here that are very good at that. Uh, kind of thing. But if they did come back up and they got into water, they would come back up with a lot of salt. So I think it's important to recognize that the, the, the contaminant that you're most likely to see is going to be salt. Sodium, calcium, chloride, you look for magnesium, sulfate, the, the major ions. They're what is most likely that you would see. Then there are typically for different shales indicator elements that are a little bit more diagnostic. Sodium is in all natural water at, you know, relatively high, con not high concentrations, but easy to measure concentrations. Uh, but there are elements like strontium, barium, and bromide that uh, have characteristic signatures of the Marcellus. And it turns out that those elements can be very, very useful in terms of identifying uh, brine uh, because they're indicators of the brines. Especially the bromide has been very useful. So that would be what I would say um, to measure. 
somebody on this side. Um, this is in the confidentiality agreement that might occur that we're kind of limiting the availability of data. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of who they would be between and what form they could? Okay, so um, homeowners uh, can be uh, approached by the gas company, and the gas company will say, you know, can we sample your water because we're, we're drilling, you know, within 2,500 feet of you. And a homeowner will acquiesce, but typically they have a confidentiality agreement. So they're going to get their water data um, from the gas company. They send it to a certified laboratory. And then that's their data, and they have a confidentiality agreement with the gas company so that it won't be released. And, you know, homeowners want to do that because maybe they want to sell that house one day, and maybe they you know, they don't want to admit that there was an incidence of, of high something in their water. Um, so then the, the gas companies in Pennsylvania, they give their data to the Department of Environmental Protection uh, because if they give it to the DEP and then that homeowner complains about a problem with their water, then the DEP can, can, can participate in the process and in the investigation to figure out what happened. If they don't give the water data to the DEP, then the company is not protected. Okay? They're just assumed to be liable if they don't give that data. So then the Department of Environmental Protection has this data, and it's considered public data, but because it has all this confidential information on it, namely you know, the person's house and where they live and all that sort of thing, they can't release that publicly. And so that pre-drill data, sometimes it also has post-drill data, would be really useful to have in order to understand the complexity of the problem in our state. And at this point, you really can't get your hands on that data. So Penn State made an agreement with the state um, to, tr to get that data and to take out all the confidential information. And we're now trying to take the reports and to put them uh, into this public online database. But it's a very tedious process where you have to get the, you know, the confidential information out and you know, type it all in. And you know, in this day and age of sort of computer databases, and you know, it could be a lot easier. Um, but that's the kind of, the kind of thing. Um, I showed one study uh, from Penn State researchers about uh, the methane, the pre-drill and post-drill methane, showing that there was no statistical difference. All that data was, was also confidential data. And I've tried to see if there would be some way for us to aggregate the data or do something with the data so that we could you know, publish pieces of it without abrogating the confidentiality, and, and there was just no way around that. Hi, Dr. Bradley. Um, I had to, well, I want to express some worry, see what you can tell me about that and ask a question. Because, as you said, the geology is different in everywhere. Um, if they were to drill in California, I'm assuming it'd be under Monterey Shale. Do you know anything about that geology and the way water would travel and toxins would travel through there? Um, I know a little, but I'm not the person to ask about this. You have a lot of fine geologists in this state that are, that are thinking about that. Um, I mean, I, I think... Uh, the companies don't want to contaminate water. You know, they, they look at this pushback that's been happening and, um, you know, they want to do it right. And uh, the companies know a lot more about how to do this than, than, you know, academic scientists and anybody else because they're the ones that are actively doing it. Um, I think what's important is to uh, make sure that when they're allowed to do it, that that there are limits on what kind of problems they can cause and um, make sure that they do it right. Um, I think this is, it, you know, if the data that the DEP that I showed here is, is a good picture, this is a pretty low incident of problems and you just have to make sure that they're very careful um, and, and that they do it in the best way possible. And I think they don't want to create a problem either. Um, um, I think my worry is because there's so much agriculture in that area and it could spread very easily. But um, my question was, uh, how is flowback treated and disposed of? Well, in the beginning days in Pennsylvania, um, 
it was trucked to Ohio and it was injected into <laughs> injection wells. And um, the reason it was done that way was that we just, we have no injection wells in Pennsylvania. We, we just legally don't have any. And Ohio had some, so we were trucking them there and we were pumping them down there. As I mentioned here, that was expensive, right? It was also creating a problem, which I'll get back to. But um, they started using it to hydrofract new wells. And so they, um, that's what 90% of the brine is, is, is pumped back down, injected uh, for hydrofracking new wells. Um, the problem, of course, is right now the number of hydrofract new wells per year is going up, but eventually we'll stop hydrofracking new wells and the brine will still be coming up. Okay? Excuse me. Now, the, the, one of the problems with trucking it to Ohio and pumping it down was it turned out that one of the injection wells in Ohio uh, was near a fault and the high volume of injected fluid caused, an earth, caused earthquakes. And that was not particularly popular in you know, the Youngstown area. And um, having said that, this has happened in other places and other wells where injection of large volumes of fluid has caused earthquakes. But we have tens of thousands of these injection wells in this country, tens of thousands. I mean, this injection of brine has been going on all over the country in many, many wells. And it's relatively infrequent that these earthquakes happen. Um, so, you know, you just have to understand, you know, that we've been doing a lot of this for, for a while. And, you know, if it's not something we want to do, then we, then we should regulate it, regulate it and stop it. Um, we certainly shouldn't inject any more fluid into wells where there's earthquakes because they're too close to a fault. But there are tens of thousands of wells where injection has been very successful. So, you know. Um, I live in Anaheim, uh, and there is fracking going on there. And that um, area is crisscrossed with faults all the way down 10,000 feet. You know, no, they're not even there. And I'm just wondering um, what the gas companies are doing about this um, problem that, the, you know, the pressure from the fracking wells uh, can move the faults or unlock the, some of the faults. Well, the, the fracking that they do, they work very hard to confine it to the layer they're trying to, to access, so the shale. Um, and they're really pretty good about doing that you know, keeping the fractures within the shale. And then along the borehole, the vertical part of the borehole, it's all cased so that the pressure is all maintained inside that borehole. And so that's, you know, they've been doing this now in Texas and Oklahoma and, and uh, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, they're pretty successful at being able to do it. Um, now your particular geology, I, you know, I don't, I don't know as much about. And I'm not necessarily the person to ask either. You'd want to talk to, you know, Harry Green, who's, who's sitting two seats back or something. I think we'll just take one more from this woman who's been very patient up in front. And then uh, last question. I guess I wasn't clear. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I appreciate it. I wasn't clear on, does the gas come out of the pipe? Is that where you, how do you, how, let me, how do you get the, extract the gas? Uh, are there spaces left where you pressurize before to just make it space? Um, and disposing of the salt, is that a concern for contaminating fresh water usage? And can you explain the, um, that the faucets that were on fire, is that anything to do with the, the um, your presentation? And the methane came out, is that just dead creatures from millions of years ago? <laughs> Okay, so I'm old enough that I'm not going to be able to remember all those questions. You're going to have to help me. Go with question number one, and then maybe you can chat a little bit. And that's the hardest one for me to remember, number one. <laughs> how, does the, how does the gas oh, okay. come out? All right, so they pump down this high-pressure fluid, and they, they got a cork at the top, in, a, in essence. They got the valve closed. And then, you know, it's extremely high, high pressure, and then they open the valve at the top, which is like opening the cork. It's high pressure down here, low pressure up there. It just comes back up. And the gas comes up with whatever the, the brine and uh, injection fluid and just comes back up to the surface. So it's, you know, it's easy. It comes right back up to the surface. Um, 
one of the questions you asked, I remember, uh, if the methane migrates into someone's drinking water, and if they then open their faucet, the water can come up in their faucet with methane. And the methane will come out. Methane actually isn't toxic. You know, if the methane just bubbles out and, you know, goes away, there'd be no problem. The problem can be if it comes out in your basement and it builds up and it explodes. And that has happened. There have been cases of explosions in basements and sheds that have been related to methane migration due to, to oil and gas um, activity. There have also been methane migration and explosions that were due to things that were totally natural. Um, but if it's coming out your faucet and you take a lighter to it, it will light. Okay. And where methane migration has happened, I may not have said this, they then go in and they cement the well and they stop it from migrating. And they can do this. So from our read of the data, something like 3% of wells in Pennsylvania have, have, have had problems with their casing and their cementing, but then they've gone back and fixed them. And only about 0.2% was there actually methane migration documented as a problem into, into somebody's, um, in, in somebody's you know, water well. And a lot of them were early on in the days, and there was one gas well in Dimmick that was thought to have allowed methane migration into eight, 18 water wells. And it's thought that the company that was doing that early on, which is one of the smaller companies, uh, was not casing correctly. And it took them a while to learn out how to do it. Um, so that was a couple of your questions. Okay, and I think we'll um, leave it there. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.